Hi, I'm Mike Helton with NASCAR, and NASCAR's in Nashville this weekend having its championship banquet for the first time. And I've got an affinity for the Country Music Hall of Fame. I've certainly got a big passion for the NASCAR Hall of Fame and keeping the history of our industry, but I've got a personal connection here at the Country Music Hall of Fame and really enjoy visiting here and seeing some of the history of the country music industry and how much and how it correlates quite frankly with the NASCAR history. Uh, but, but Peter Cooper from the Hall of Fame is going to show us around a little bit here and point out some of the key exhibits. Yeah, and I'm not worried about uh, about spoiling it for folks who want to visit here because we've just got a few minutes and uh, this is this exhibit can uh, take hours to see. This is a uh, uh, we're in a place uh, called Outlaws and Armadillos, Country's Roaring 70s. That's the exhibit uh, here now. And um, it's, it was a really interesting time in country music, as it was in NASCAR. Um, but the 1970s was when the recording artists essentially took creative control uh, from producers and, and record company folks. It, it, was, it, uh, it resulted in... Uh, it was like taking the restrictor plates off of country music, and there was wild stuff that happened, and this exhibit is all about that. That, that was a fun era, uh, and, and I look back and I kind of think that in every industry, particularly the entertainment industry and the country music, who were real people anyway. I mean, they were what you saw and felt and heard. And, and I think after we got through the 60s, then and technology was able to spread and the fact that it says, okay, it's okay if I have an opinion. It's okay if I speak out. And I think that trickled into the entertainment, particularly the country music first. But even in NASCAR, we had characters that come along in the 70s. There was Richard Petty and David Pearson who had kind of established their self. Uh, but Cale Yarborough and Bobby Allison, and then toward the end of the 70s, Darrell Waltrip shows up. And, and they, were, they were icebreakers. I yes. mean, they, they've got a reputation for saying, no, I don't, I'm not status quo, this is what I want to do. Right. And it reminds me of this era. Right, right. Another thing, uh, another connection with uh, NASCAR um, is um, um, bootleg whiskey. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I'll tell you, uh, there was, it was a, uh, country music's greatest storyteller, uh, Tom T. Hall, right. uh, emerged in the 70s, and um, his uh, best buddy, was a guy named uh, the Reverend Will D. Campbell, and uh, he called himself a bootleg preacher. He, uh, he was ordained in the Baptist church. He said, uh, the way I read my Bible, if you're gonna love one, you gotta love them all. And he was a good pal and philosophizer to, uh, <laughs> to uh, numerous country music artists. Uh, he baptized Shooter Jennings, Waylon's son, and uh, he and Tom T. Hall uh, used to ride around on Tom T's tour bus with uh, Alex Haley, the guy that wrote Roots, and Miller Williams, a poet laureate from Arkansas, and they would stop at towns and uh, get out and just talk to people, uh, and they would uh, they would drink some uh, whiskey made from a still that Tom T and the Reverend Will D Campbell made and had on Tom <laughs> T's property so that's so the uh, old when, strawberry wine was a real story exactly <laughs> so I, I uh, uh, when we were beginning this exhibit I went to Tom T's house and said hey I, I sure would like a way to represent brother Will in this exhibit and uh, uh, he said well here's a I got a pen and ink drawing of, uh, of Will with the whiskey still that we made would you like that absolutely that's great whatever happened to the still and uh, he said well I quit drinking 25 years ago or so um, um, uh, the stills over there in the in the corner. You want that? And so that was uh, <clears throat> that still was in my minivan uh, uh, shortly thereafter, and we now have now it's it on this one. right over here. And we've got we've got a still on display in the NASCAR Hall of Fame, but it was Junior Johnson's. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I always tell people that the country music in NASCAR is like bread and butter, or Jack and Coke, depending on what your mood is. Right. <laughs> right. Well, Junior knew bread, butter, and Jack and Coke, and <laughs> knew a little bit about drafting yeah. as well. Um, this guitar looks like it's been rode hard and put up wet, because it was. That was a Shel Silverstein's um, guitar. Shel Silverstein was uh, a remarkable songwriter, and um, uh, he was also, uh, he, he wrote children's 
books and, uh, and wrote, uh, car uh, drew cartoons for Playboy magazine. He was a man of many Diverse talents. Diverse character. <laughs> yeah. And uh, he, this was the guitar that he kept uh, uh, in Nashville. You can tell it was his because there's the little label maker says Shell on there. Um, and that was at Bobby Bear's house. Uh, he was Bobby Bear's good buddy and wrote um, the, the first album uh, the, uh, of the outlaw movement in country music was uh, really Bobby Bear's Lullabies, Legends, and Lies. Bobby Bear had uh, he told RCA Records that um, if they would stop passing them around to different producers and having them answer to different people, he can make records quicker, uh, cheaper, and better than they were making. And um, RCA's Chet Atkins said, okay. And um, <laughs> that was open in a Pandora's box. As soon as Willie Nelson and Waylon Jennings heard about that, they demanded that same kind same of artistic kind of freedom. Uh, and the first album that Bear did, um, uh, this Lullabies, Legends, and Lies album was uh, was written by Shel Silverstein. Bear said, you know, I just, you know, I just, I just want Shel to write these songs. So I love that, that guitar. Um, <clears throat> this guitar is a remarkable piece. My, uh, this, this was owned by a guy named Cowboy Jack Clement. He was called Cowboy, uh, even though he didn't, he hated horses. Um, uh, and he it, it wore comfortable shoes and Hawaiian shirts most of the time. But, this was in his uh, studio, which was also his home. He had the first professional grade home studio in Nashville. And um, he said, you know, I, I come to figure out that, that a, a recording studio might be the worst place to make music. And so he wanted to <laughs> do it at his home and uh, where everybody was comfortable. And uh, everybody had a key to Cowboy's house and they didn't need it because his uh, kitchen door was always open. And, we all knew that, but that, that guitar has been passed around to uh, Chris Christopherson and Waylon Jennings and uh, uh, Johnny Cash and, and so many others. Um, it, was, it was Nashville's community guitar, and now it belongs to the world here. Uh, as as my museum. grandmother say, it's got good bones. It's got real good <laughs> bones. It's a, it's a uh, early 50s Gibson SJ200, and uh, Cowboy bought it new at a music store near Washington, D.C., and he said uh, they brought it out and had the, had the uh, kind of paper over it in the case, and uh, he said removing that paper was like a, taking a sexy uh, negligee off a, off a woman. Uh, <laughs> he said, I had to have that, and uh, he did, but he, he shared it with everybody. The, the, the whole outlaw experience was pretty communal you know it was it was real people making yeah. music together um, and not worrying about who was stealing each other's melodies and such and it created a lot of great music for us to to hang our hats on and remember what it was like and <clears throat> yeah it fit the times and and now it's legendary but it really fit the times in the 70s when these characters kind of broke out and yeah. Did it their own way. Yeah. And a lot of Texas got to Tennessee, and I think a little Tennessee got to Texas. But uh, There was a, a lot of that, and, and there came to be a, a feeling of some kind of rivalry between Texas and Tennessee, uh, which was essentially false. Uh, all the, the Texas greats wound up coming to Nashville to record, and uh, so many of the Nashville greats went down to Texas to play live music and uh, and you know, experiment and commune yeah. uh, with others. It was a it was a time of sharing, um, and and it was it was a time when when musicians were um, allowed. And I shouldn't say allowed. They demanded the right to uh, make their own creative decisions, and uh, marketers marketed <laughs> what was done. Willie Nelson turned in in 1975, the Red Headed Stranger album and the the folks at Columbia Records said oh well, this sounds like a demo it's just it's just a, an acoustic guitar and a little bit of bass and not much going on and you know uh, and Willie's lawyer said to the record company well um, you paid a lot for what you're saying sounds like a demo and um, it's probably in your best interest to uh, to market it Motive as such it. and it became Willie's commercial breakthrough yeah Peter I just I want to say thanks for and taking the time and showing us around a little bit and 
like you said earlier, this is only a tiny piece of what you can see in the Country Music Hall of Fame. And, and uh, come up to Charlotte soon and then we'll get you a tour of the NASCAR Hall of Fame and blend all this stuff together. I look forward to that. I'm, I'm uh, from around Spartanburg, South Carolina, so not then far you from understand. Charlotte. Yeah. I, I sure do. Where David Pearson's from. That's right. Yeah. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Mike.